What's up, y'all? I started like a minute early, so um, just in case there was any issues. Alexa, stop. I've been having to tell Alexa to pipe down. Sorry. <sighs> What's up, y'all? What's up, y'all? File in. Appreciate y'all. We're going to start on the dot. Oh, I don't really... You can, like, change the title of this, right? Is that possible? If you guys know... How exactly do you change the... Like, put the title on here? Hmm. I think you have to... Can you, oh, Grace. Okay, whatever. It's all good. You guys know why you're here. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to get straight to it because we got to, you know what I'm saying, we want to be a timely, a timely ministry. Um, I know you guys have a, a lot that you guys are doing and stuff like that. So let's get straight into it. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, today we're going to be talking about grace. Um, how this came about is, you know, a while back I, you know, we did a poll on Instagram on the story to see if you guys wanted to do Bible studies like live like this. Um, overwhelming affirming response so you know I, I've been thinking about it like what I wanted to talk about and last couple weeks back I did an episode on grace and just the feedback was overwhelming with that and um, I definitely wanted to make sure that we expanded on this topic and I'm so happy and I'm so privileged and honored to even talk about this because every time you talk about the grace you are inevitably talking about talking about grace you are inevitably talking about um, the gospel. So I'm ready to share the gospel with y'all today, man. So how this is going to work is I would really encourage everyone to pull out their notes, um, have notes out in front of you, have your Bible out in front of you. Um, if you can't follow along when we're reading through the different scriptures, um, thank you still do. I appreciate that. Um, if you can't follow along as we're reading through the scriptures, then feel free to like at least just write them down and like just have this recorded somewhere. I'm also going to be recording this and making sure that uh, we put it on YouTube or something like that. So let's get straight into it. Um, and you can also, I believe you can ask questions as you go. Like, I think that there's like a Q&A thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. There's a Q&A thing. So feel free to ask any questions as you as I go and I'll look up and I'll see if there's anything there. If there's anything there, I'll stop and I'll answer it. Um, but let's get into it. So we're talking about grace um, and the point of this whole thing is, you know, what I want you guys to take away from everything at the end of the day is that God loves you. God wants you to be with him. He wants you in his presence. Um, you know, a lot of us, we feel so dirty after we sin. A lot of us feel like we can't even have a relationship with God because of the sin that we've committed. Um, and because of that, a lot of us don't have a relationship with God. Or some of us have walked away. Some of us backslid like we slipped up and we stayed away because we thought it would be way too shameful of us to come back to God after we have uh, slipped and fell away. And I've been in that position. I think the most notable time that that happened to me was in um, February of 2019. And what's crazy is that, you know, if, if I stayed away, there would be no one associated by now. So glory to God, let's get into it. Um, first thing I have to talk about is the holiness of God. So we're going to get to grace, but the first thing when we talk about grace, we have to talk about the holiness of God. And why is the holiness of God so important? So when we talk about holiness of God, we're talking about the fact that God is set apart and set above mankind. You have the creator and you have the creation. Um, and he has this perfect standard. God is absolutely perfect. He is you know, the Bible says that he is light and there is no darkness in him. He's absolutely perfect, set apart, standard. That That is it. And the reality is that when he created us, he created us in his image, right? So we, we, were, we were like him. We were his image bearers. We were made with the purpose of glorifying him and so on. Um, but what happened was when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, they became knowledgeable of good and evil. And what happened was that they, they developed a sinful nature. When we talk about sinful nature, we're talking about a set of desires um, that go against God's will, that want something besides what God wants. 
We're talking about a set of desires that is more consumed with our own self-exaltation or our own self-fulfillment or our own self-preservation over God. Um, and ultimately, as we started to live a life engulfed in this sinful nature, right? This is what separated us from God because he has this standard of holiness. He is holy, right? Um, so I would I would imagine that, you know, when you're thinking about God's holiness, one thing in uh, in class that they would like to tell us is that he's like an ocean. God's holiness is like an ocean. Like, you know, an ocean is beautiful, right? But you definitely don't want to get caught up in like the middle of the ocean with no land that you can see. Or it's like that fine china that your mom has and like it's beautiful but there are real repercussions to excuse me to breaking it you know there's accounts in the bible where and this is before jesus christ had died for our sins there's accounts in the bible where um i believe um i think it was the sons of aaron and they did a sacrifice wrong and god destroyed them burned them with fire right at the spot you know we look at t p um passages like that to really tell us and speak to us about the holiness of God. Like this is a perfect standard. And we don't even understand the gravity of the sin that we commit. We don't understand it, right? So when we have these sinful desires, the sinful nature now put upon us, Adam and Eve, Ava, the forbidden fruit, there's this separation, um, this further separation between the creator and the created. And at that point, God had all the right, even before that, God had all the right to just say, you know what? I tried with these people. It didn't work. It is what it is. Um, but he didn't do that because he loved us. So mankind had sins and it made them not holy enough to have a relationship with God. So what did God do? He took what was making us not holy enough to have a relationship with him and he took it away. He's done something to make sure it could be taken away. It could be taken out of the equation. That is what, that's where grace starts right there. It's the fact that Mankind is at some point what you call an enemy of God, living in rebellion, living according to our sinful nature. And rather than God just saying, you know what, I'm done with these people. He has literally gone the extra mile to try and have a relationship with us and make things work. All right. Um, that's the beginning of grace. So this is where Jesus Christ comes in and this is where the gospel comes in because this whole process of wiping our sins away is what Jesus has done. So we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And I'll say that again just so you guys can um, maybe write it down if you guys want to flip to it. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, God made him who had no sin, talking about Jesus, God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Essentially, what Jesus did was because we can't be holy enough, we can't be perfect enough to have a relationship with God. What Jesus did was wipe his death, wiped away our sins, so then we can have a relationship with God. Because what happens is, in Colossians verse, um, in Colossians one thirteen, just write that down. Colossians one thirteen, it talks about how we're transferred out of the domain of darkness and into the domain of His Son. Right? When we're living in our sinful nature, we're we're done. We're in the domain of darkness. But when Jesus dies for our sins, we're transferred into the domain of His Son. Um, when when Jesus dies for our sins, uh, picture it like Jesus is this perfect human being, right? And we are this sinful human being. And Jesus died for our sins. It's almost like we switch places. We switch places and he became, you know, all the sin of the world was put on his shoulders. And then we became this like righteous person in God's sight. Jesus dies for our sins. He resurrects. And we have this relationship with God when we have faith in Jesus Christ and the things that he did for us. So that's why the word of God says something like um, another one is I want you guys to write down. Colossians chapter 1 verse 22 where it talks about how right now today if you have Jesus Christ you are holy and blameless in the sight of God that's very important that you know that about God's grace in the times where you think that you're super dirty that you can't have a relationship with God what God is what the word of God tells us is that if you have Christ God the way God sees you 
is that you are holy and you are blameless. But here's the kicker. You are holy and you are blameless because of what Jesus did. All right. Here's where it might get a little complicated for some people. We are not justified. And when I say justified, I'm talking about like, um, like uh, when you justify somebody in court, like, like, you know, you, you let them free of their charges and like they, they're good now, right? We're not justified because we do good things. That is something we need to understand. We are justified because of the grace of God. You're not justified because you don't have premarital sex. Uh, you don't drink and you don't get drunk. Or um, what, what are the other ones that people think? You, you're, not, you're not now justified because you don't cuss. You're not justified because there's so many things that other people do that you don't do. You're not justified because you are more righteous than anybody else. No, 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 no. Like, literally this entire process is an act of God. God saw us in our sinful desires and said, I'm going to make a way for them to have a relationship with me, even though they do not deserve it, even though they've done nothing to deserve it. You've done nothing to deserve your relationship with God, and you cannot deserve your relationship with God. The first thing I talked about today was God's holiness, and the reason why I had to talk about God's holiness and his standard being so high above us is because... A lot of us think what it means to be a Christian is to follow all these rules in order to reach that standard, that holy standard. But you can't like you legit. If today you made the decision to never sin again in your life, right, you still would not meet that holy standard because I'm 23. Other people here are probably like 20 something, whatever what about the sins that you've already committed? Or what about the fact that you were literally born into sin? Like we are born into this default position of not being worthy enough to have a relationship with God. And you can do as much works as you want to do. And it's not, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, it means absolutely nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Um, John three sixteen. we all know it. We all love it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. All right. And verse 18 says something really powerful. It says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. It says that anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus is condemned already. So it really highlights this position where we were born into this state of needing Jesus. We're born into the state of not ha not being enough. We can never be enough. You know, there's so many of us like the fact that we're never enough bothers us so much. The fact that we slip up and we sin bothers us so much. And don't get me wrong, like you should feel some type of conviction when you sin. Like that's that's facts, like right? But at the same time, some of us go too far to the point where we only feel good if like how should I put this? Some of us feeling so bad while we're while we like, you know, messed up, it kind of shows the fact that we thought that God loved us because because we start to we start to let me try to like say this as clear as possible. A lot of us we sin and we think that God loves us less. A lot of us we sin and we feel like, you know, we can never have a relationship with God. But the thing is, when you automatically when you know that you even if you lived tried your best to never sin again, you would still like not meet that standard. You know, God didn't send his only son to die for you because you were meeting standards literally like read romans chapter 5 romans chapter 5 verse 8 something i quote probably my most quoted verse like ever because i talk about it all the time the bible says that while we were yet sinners christ died for us so everybody on earth has been given this gift of salvation and this gift of a relationship with god 
by his own grace. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse um, 8, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not for your, from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Literally what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say. Not by works so that no one can boast. All right? If you are a Christian today, you are not a Christian because you follow all the rules. You are a Christian because you have faith in Jesus Christ. You believe that he is your Lord and Savior. And you live a life to glorify God and deny yourself. That's why you are a Christian. It's not because you're following a list of rules. That's the reason why all the time you hear that Christians will say that this is not a religion. It is a relationship. When you think about the typical religion, the typical religion is about following rules in order to please God. But as a Christian, you are admitting that you cannot follow enough rules in order to please God. You are imperfect and you do have flaws. You are inadequate. You do have shortcomings and you need Jesus. You need Jesus to make you better. You need Jesus to have access to the Father. That is what it means to be a Christian. A lot of people get that mixed up with just trying to be a good person. And a lot of people think to themselves, all right, you know, I'm just going to be a good person. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to get into heaven. I'm going to try to get to heaven by, you know, doing all these good deeds and stuff like that. But there's a reason why it doesn't work, right? Um, a lot of people only think that they're a good person, mind you, because they they measure themselves to other people. Like, they say that, oh, well, I'm not as bad as so, so, and so. I'm not as... You know, I didn't do as much sin as that person. So that means I'm a good person. And, you know, they think that they can now get to heaven and earn their way to heaven by following the law. And when I talk about the law, when the Bible talks about the law, we're talking about, um, like, you know, you, you read all the, uh, the Old Testament. And you see all the laws that God gave to the children of Israel. Um, you know, all of these laws. These things were given to the children of Israel by God, and the purpose was to point them in the direction of God, right? But there was an issue that came up with the law, and which is the reason which is which is the reason why we cannot be justified by the law by doing all these good deeds. So I'm gonna to read to you guys a passage, right? This one's gonna be like the longest I read today. But it's Bible study, so I mean we're gonna to have to read verses. So I'm going to, I don't think a lot of people have actually read this, like this, this deep. Um, like I, even like me learning this in class was like, um, it wasn't a completely new concept, but just in explaining it, it was, it was definitely new for me. Um, in Romans chapter seven, Romans chapter seven, starting at verse four, we're going to read what apostle Paul has to say about following the law, because there's some of us who you know, we've kind of not really understood how we are justified by grace, but instead we think that we are justified by the law. And we put all of our focus and our attention on trying to do good deeds. Um, but this is what Apostle Paul has to say about that. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 4. So many, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another. Apostle Paul is saying we're free from the law. We're free from following the law so we can be married, married in a sense, to Christ. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Even that first verse is saying that we're dead from the law. We don't follow the law anymore. Instead, we follow Christ. And by following Christ, this is how we bear fruit for God. Verse 5. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, this is talking about when we were dead in our sin and trespasses, when we were had this sinful nature, this is before Jesus Christ came into our lives. When we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions, listen to this, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruits for death. It said the sinful passions in us were aroused by the law. All right. Keep that. Verse 6. But now, by dying to what once bound us, the law, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. We are released from the law and we serve in a new way of the Spirit. All right? And 
not in the old way of the written code, not, not following written laws. What shall we say then? Is the lawful sinful? Is the law sinful? So he's asking a question. He's saying, since our sinful passions were was aroused by the law, is the law a bad thing? All right. Is the law itself a bad thing? Verse verse seven, it says, what shall we then? What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said you shall not covet. All right. Verse eight. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, excuse me, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. All right. It said it said seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment. We'll, we'll come back to that. Verse nine. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy righteous and good so that was a lot let's let's go deeper into this all right so basically what apostle paul is saying that when we are living to try and justify ourselves by the law right the law is actually not giving us life not giving us eternal life and it's not making us better all right i know this all sounds crazy but i promise it's gonna it's gonna make sense in the end <laughs> It says in verse 5 that the sinful passions were aroused by the law. So the law itself is not bad. Let's get that straight. But the reality of when the law is mixed with our sinful nature, what happens is that our reaction, our response to rules being put in front of us because of our sinful nature is that the rules entice us to break them. It's, it, that's, that's the crazy part. The, if we are trying to follow a list of rules, we are enticed to break them. We are aroused to break them. Okay. So then what does it look like to live by the law? And I'm going to read this verse in verse 15, same place, verse 15. And this sounds so much like how many of us struggle with sin. Apostle Paul writes, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate, I do. How many of us can be honest and talk about the amount of times where we knew exactly what we wanted to do, but we couldn't do it, right? We knew exactly what we wanted to do. We knew exactly what the right thing was to do. You know, a lot of us, a lot of us, that case looks like sexual sin. It looks like jealousy. It looks like comparison, so on, right? I think that's, that right there encapsulates so much, right? But we know what we want to do. We don't want to do those things, but we do them anyways. This is the battle that we have when we are trying to justify ourselves by the law. When you are trying to be the Christian, right, that is just for, or the human being that is focused on, all right, I got to follow this law, this law, this law, this law, this law, you know, and if I follow this law, then I can be righteous enough to earn God's um, righteousness. What's actually, what you're actually going to experience is this battle where, you want to do something, but you're not going to do it. And every time that you hear like a rule or a law, you're going to be enticed to break it. That's what the word of God is saying on this matter. So in summary, when you are tr when you try to follow the law in order to be righteous, you are only enticing the sinful passions that you have. That's scripture. So, so, so far, what we've covered is that God is holy and he has a standard that we cannot obtain by ourselves. We have covered the fact that we have a sinful nature. We have this set of desires that go against God's will. 
And these things have separated us from God. But God, because of his grace, sent his only son to take away our sins, the things that were separating us from him, so that we can have a relationship with him and we could have eternal life. Not because we do everything good, but because we have faith in Jesus Christ. God gave us the gift of Jesus Christ dying for our sins, which is grace. And when we affirm Jesus Christ and we say, Jesus Christ, you know, you are my savior. I'm living for you. I have faith that you died and raised from the dead. That is us receiving this gift of grace. That is the receiving of the gift, right? All right. So you might be wondering, I think anybody would like at this point think like, okay, then what's stopping me from just continuing to live a life of sin? Like what on earth can be like, all right, you know, you're telling me that this law, if I follow the law, then it's going to be all this bad stuff to happen. And, you know, I'm already saved because of God's grace. Like, why would I continue to follow? Like, what's the, where's the accountability? Why can't I just go out and do whatever you want to do? What should we focus on instead? You know what I'm saying? So what we do know is that when we believe in Jesus Christ, God's work does not stop right there. If you read Galatians chapter three, verse one and two, Paul reveals to us that we when we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive the spirit of God. You know, when Jesus left, I believe this is in John. Um, I want to say John 14. I could be wrong. But Jesus said that when he's leaving, right, he's sending someone, a helper alongside. Um, and who he was talking about was the Holy Spirit. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. We are given the Holy Spirit. Um, excuse me, sorry, I'm birthing. <laughs> we are given the Holy Spirit of God, all right? So, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, and I would definitely recommend reading the entire book of Galatians chapter 5. I'm sorry, the entire chapter, Galatians chapter 5. It says, but I say, it's Apostle Paul writing, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's what it says. Because we don't want to carry out the desires of the flesh, right? We don't want to continue to sin and separate us from God and so on. So the remedy is saying, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. What does it mean by walk by the spirit? You know, you see in different places of the scripture, it talks about being, you know, walking by the spirit, being led by the spirit, being filled with the spirit. And the way you can kind of summarize this whole thing is that we are called to live a life where we are yielding to the spirit. You know, this the spirit will lead you in directions. It'll it'll convict you. It'll, you know, communicate things to you. And we need to yield to the spirit daily um, and even allow ourselves to be led by the spirit into these battles against temptation. You know, when you look at, I believe, Matthew chapter four, you see that Jesus is led into the wilderness by the spirit of God. Right. And in the wilderness, he's tempted of the devil. So the Holy Spirit's job in our lives is to help us, is to lead us in the battle against sin. This is the force that's going to help us break these habitual sins that we have. Some of it's pornography, it's masturbation, it's sexual, other sexual sins, it's drunkenness, it's, it's envy, it's uh, uh, things that might sound worse or whatever it might be. Like the Holy Spirit is the person that's going to be leading us in these battles against, against sin. I can talk, I can testify to this myself in where you know, an addiction I had, like a sexual addiction that I had um, for years and years. I tried to do all these practical things in order to stop, right? I tried to, you know, read, you know, Proverbs 7 over and over and over and over again about how bad it was to, to do certain things. And, you know, <clears throat> I would do like I would read it, but then I continue to do it. Right. Because I wasn't I, I honestly I wasn't relying on the spirit. I was just trying to not do it. I was willpower. I was trying to not do it. But there was a shift in my life when I truly said, you know what? Enough is enough, right? And the spirit truly did take me on a journey where I, what I was focused on was really my relationship with Christ. I was focused on my relationship with the father. 
Um, and it was just times where I would have my quiet time, my devotion, and the Spirit would communicate to me. You know, it would give me all these lessons where I'd be led to fast more often and so on. And as I drew closer to God and as I was being led by the Spirit, when I tell you today, you know, I'm free from these habitual sins that were once weighing me down, that was once, you know, like destroying me, right? Um, so we don't focus on following the laws in order to be righteous instead what happens is that we rely on on the spirit we yield to the spirit of god that we receive once we believe in jesus christ by faith we yield to the spirit daily um and we be led by the spirit into battle against the flesh um and as we are battling the flesh we are made to be more and more like christ which is why we are called Christians, because the aim is to be like Christ. When we are walking by the Spirit in our lives, that is what's going to make us more like Christ. Not just trying to follow rules, because the rules are going to only entice you to continue to in your sin. There's something called the fruits of the Spirit. I talk about this very often. <laughs> um, and in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, um, they're listed. It says, the fruits of the Spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such there is no law so as we are living a life yielding to the spirit being led by the spirit walking by the spirit and that is our focus we are going to see products of that there are going to be things that are evident like that are evidence of that walk and the things that are evidence of that walk is love, is joy, is peace, is patience, is kindness, is lo uh, is good goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Right? A lot of us, you know, that self control, and that was a big one for me. And it says, against such there is no law, because the reality is, so many of us are trying to follow the law in order to be righteous. Right. But what the Bible is telling us is that when we are filled by the Spirit, we are influenced by the Spirit, we are led by the Spirit. That relationship is what is going to produce these qualities in our lives. And when we have these qualities produced in our lives, there is no need for a law. There is no need for it. Against such, there is no law. That's, this is the gospel right here. It's not that we follow these rules. They tried following rules throughout the entire Old Testament. What happened? Every time the children of Israel would turn their back on God, 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 turn their back on God. I mean, and that's, that's literally the story of my life as well, the story of many of our lives as well. We, we try to follow the rules and we messed up all the time. We fell short all the time, fell short all the time. Until some of us had got to the point where we're like, you know what, I can't keep up with this stuff. I'm out. You know, we packed our things and we said, you know what? I tried this God thing out. We just felt too dirty. But that's not what Jesus wants. That's not what the Father wants. The Father wants us to rely on the Spirit to, to guide us and lead us, you know, against, against our flesh. So, what happens is that we believe in Jesus by faith. We receive the Spirit of God. And then we walk by the Spirit of God. And as we walk by the Spirit of God, we bear the fruits of the Spirit. That is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And when we bear these things, we don't need the rule book. All right? You've heard that saying that says, faith without works is dead. It's commonly, you know, kind of taken out of context. What's going on in, in that, I believe it's in James chapter 2, talks about faith, um, faith without works is dead. A lot of people use it to say like... Um, you know, you got to work hard and you have to have faith, which is true. But that's not the point of, you know, that that passage. The point of that passage is to talk about, you know, the author was talking about how you can say you have faith. Right. But faith is supposed to produce good works is what he was trying to say. So if you are um, a Christian, evidence of you being a Christian should be your good works. But there's a difference, and I want to highlight this difference. Is there's difference? There's a difference between good works being the evidence of your of your faith and your relationship with God, and trying to do good works in order to be in a relationship with God. So the way I like to put it is that we are not saved by our works, but we are saved unto good works. Right? 
when we have the fruit of this, when we have the spirit in us and we have the fruit of the spirit, then that means that we are going, you're going to see the evidence of that in our life, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we have to do these things in order to have a relationship with God. That's backwards. That's backwards. All right. So. Do Christians still sin, though? Yes, Christians still sin. Um, and, you know, a lot of us, we became Christians and we were on fire for Jesus until we fell and we had a really bad mess up. Um, and then, you know, there's two different ways that people can react when they fall. Some people, when they when they fall, they, you know, they get back up because they acknowledge God's grace over their lives and they get back in line, which is what God wants us to do. But some of us, instead, what we do is that we think we are too dirty and, and we don't come back to God. Um, and that voice in your head that is telling you that you are too dirty and you shouldn't go back to God is what I would call the devil himself. Like that is the enemy, evil spirit, whatever. You, that is the enemy. That is not God. That is not Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit can convict us to the point where it's like we should know, all right, this is bad. Let me go back to the Father. But that guilt to the point where it's like trying to keep you from having a conversation with God and separate you from God, that comes from the enemy. All right. So when we fall, it's important for us to acknowledge God's grace. Um, and I think a really good place um, is Ephesians chapter two, starting at verse four. Um, it says, but God, excuse me, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the boundless, that's a key word, boundless riches of his grace and in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is what God wants to do with us. He wants to put us in a place and he wants to show us his boundless riches of his grace, boundless riches of his grace and kindness towards us. To say that you are too dirty to have a relationship with the Father and you believe in Jesus Christ is to say that Jesus Christ, the blood that he shed was not powerful enough. To say that you are too dirty to come to God is to diminish, is to demean, look down upon what Jesus Christ has done for you. I know we don't mean to do this, but this is the gravity of the situation. This is why it's so important for us to understand grace. Jesus Christ did not die for nothing. He did not die for you to sin and then feel like you cannot have access to God. Literally the op opposite. He died for people who have been dead in their sin, sin and trespasses for them to be able to be seen as holy and blameless in the sight of God. Now, of course, that does not give us the license to go and do whatever we want to do because God is not mocked. I believe it's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 that says, you know, when you receive the knowledge of Christ and you continue to willfully sin, continue to go out and, and, and adamantly continue to live a lifestyle of sin, then there is no sacrifice of sins. You, you, you have tried to, God knows the difference between someone who is trying and someone who is trying to take advantage of his grace. And God is not mocked. Right? But God wants to pick you up every time you fall. God wants you to come back to him every time you fall. For us to think that we are doing some type of justice by not coming back to God after we fall is completely backwards. You know, we're essentially not, we're essentially trespassing against God. And then ditching him. When in reality, I would think that the best apology would be to actually come come back to him. You know, when we're talking about grace and accepting grace, there's a process that all of us need to go through. And it's the process of admitting that we are inadequate. We do have shortcomings. We are imperfect. You know, 
it, Christians are stereotyped to be the complete opposite, though. Like, we're, we're supposed to be, like, the very holier than thou. But to be a Christian, this is what it means to be a Christian. You are admitting your shortcomings. But some of us, we stop there and we admit our shortcomings and we think, all right, boom, like I'm too, I'm too dirty. Like, that's why, like I'm too, I'm too dirty. But God is not in the business of, of showing you your shortcomings and telling you how much you sin so that you can separate from him. God wants to show you your shortcomings so you know that a relationship with him is a necessity, you know, so you know the gravity of how much he loves you. And, and, and the, real, the seriousness of what Jesus Christ has done for you. That's the point. That is the point. Every single time you can bet your bottom dollar, God wants you back. You know, maybe that's like the real title of, of this, entire, this entire thing. First John chapter 1 verse 9. It says, this is First John chapter 1 verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Look at that. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Circle the word all. All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. There's a million other verses that I could talk about. This is one verse that says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Trust me, man. Like if I were to live life and try to justify, justify myself and feel good about myself based on the things that I've done, I would not have the audacity to come on this live and talk to anybody about God. But it's because I acknowledge God's grace over my life. I do not believe I've deserved the right to be a servant of God. I don't believe I've deserved the right to preach. I don't believe I've deserved, and nobody deserves any right before God. But we are who we are by the grace of God. We have a relationship with him by the grace of God. We continually have access to him by the grace of God. And if there's one thing that I want everybody to truly understand um, from this entire live is that if you have been in a place where you think that God hates you and you think that it's done, you, you can't come back and, you know, you, you've, you've done way too many times, like... You will sin, you'll ask God for forgiveness, and then you go back and you sin again, and you ask God forgiveness, and then you go back and sin again. I, I'm here, like, I struggle too. And that specifically was me for years, you know. But let me be a witness and let me, you know, be a testimony to you that, man, like, God still wants something to do with you. The fact that unassociated exists, let that be a testimony to you, man, because I'm not, I'm not perfect. You know, I have messed up. I have done bad things, you know, but by the grace of God, just like Apostle Paul said, by the grace of God, um, he is what he is and I am what I am and you are what you are. Um, so, yeah, that was a lot. Um, I don't know how many people were here from beginning to end, but if you would like to have, I don't think we have any questions, but... If you would like to have any further discussions with me, please um, reach out, like DM Unassociated. Um, you know, it's a couple of us that run the page, but I'm always going to be able to see it um, one way or another. Um, so reach out, reach out. And if you are here and you want to make that decision to follow Jesus Christ and you haven't, yo, let's let's pray about it right now. You know, let's pray about it right now. And if that's you, then we can talk about it later on, like, you know, DM us and we can have a further conversation on on what would be the next steps for you and like what life can be like after that. So if you are someone who has not committed their life to Christ, um, pray this with me. All right. Dear Father, I am a sinner. I confess my sins to you. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that you raised him from the dead. I deny myself and I want to live my life for you. I am saved by your grace. Today, I accept the free gift you've given me. And I tell you that I have faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for what you have done. I surrender my life to you. 
Let your name be glorified in my life. Make my heart your home. I welcome the Holy Spirit into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. Hit me. Please do not be shy. This is a community. Um, let's have this conversation. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you guys for coming out. Love you guys. Yeah. <laughs>